Thank you. you. may be seated. It's always nice to sing those hymns that deal with the family and with the home, with the centrality of our Lord Jesus Christ in the home. Especially on Mother's Day and Father's Day, we have a number of hymns that are that way. And today is Mother's Day, a very wonderful and exciting day. A day, that, of course, I've always enjoyed very much as I look back over the years with my dear wife, Judy, and all the incredible children that God gave to us, the way in which she taught them and trained them and raised them in the fear of the Lord, encouraged them to maximize their potential and not to sit around and do nothing, and how thankful I am that she did that. It's a great encouragement to me. I had a phone call from several of my children yesterday. They call me on a regular basis now that Judy is gone. And uh, we're getting ready for Evangeline's wedding in just two weeks. Hard to believe that. Another one is uh, headed out as a straight arrow to serve Christ. And how thankful I am for that. But he was calling to say uh, that he was taking care of one of the projects that I was supposed to have to take care of for the wedding. And it was something that had been eating away at the back of my mind and uh, thinking, when will I ever have time to do that? Going down to Home Depot and buying stuff and putting it together and making things so that it will look right at the wedding. And uh, he called me and he said, don't worry about it. He says, I've actually ordered all these things. They'll come in nine large containers by UPS and it'll probably be here next week. And don't worry about trying to set it up. I'll have it all set up. I'm getting in there early on Thursday morning and uh, the brothers and I will put it all together. It's wonderful, dear friends, it is wonderful to have a Christian home. It should be the goal of every young person, male and female, boy and girl, young woman, young man, to have a home where Christ is loved, where the Lord Jesus Christ is honored, where the husband fulfills his role portraying what Christ is like our heavenly bridegroom and what the church should be like the one who is his bride and how we yearn for that day when we should be caught up to meet him in the clouds and evermore be with the Lord and enter into the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven what a marvelous time that will be with the one who is our heavenly bridegroom wife and mother choices make a difference. Choices make a difference. That's the title today, Wife and Mother. Choices make a difference. In considering the choice of a life partner, I think we all recognize that choices do make a difference. The one you marry will determine certain courses in your life. What will be accomplished for Christ what will not be accomplished for Christ. A man's service to God will be affected by the wife he chooses. A man's children will be molded for the service of Christ by the wife he chooses. How well I know that from the blessed 40 years that I had with my dear beloved wife Judy. A man who chooses a wife based on physical beauty will soon be disappointed because we all grow old and wrinkled and physical beauty very soon vanishes. A woman who chooses a man based on physical strength and youth will soon be disappointed because he will become weak and feeble as the years go by. One of the first lessons we learn in the book of Ruth about the kind of wife and mother for his children that a godly man will want is found in Ruth chapter 1. I'm going to do, the Lord willing, if our time permits, a brief overview of the book of Ruth with the focus on that final chapter, chapter 4, which we've read just a few moments ago. But that is preceded for us by some very important lessons that help us to understand what it is that is important for a godly Christian marriage and thus for godly Christian motherhood. There are some foundational principles that are given to us in Ruth chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 that outline for us why there is a happy conclusion in Ruth chapter 4. One of the first lessons we learn in the book of Ruth 
about the kind of wife and mother for his children that a godly man will want is found in this first chapter. The girl or woman who wants a godly husband will also take this lesson to heart. If she wins the heart of a man any other way, it will soon be a relationship that will tarnish. The context of Ruth 1 is the death of Naomi's husband, Elimelech, and the death of her two sons, Mahlon and Kilian, leaving her and her two daughters-in-law as widows. Now, a lot could be said, of course, about Elimelech being out of fellowship when he went to Moab, not trusting God to stay in the land. Others stayed in the land. Obviously, there were still people there in Bethlehem. Boaz was still in Bethlehem. He had stayed in the center of God's will. That was where God had placed his people. And God had blessed him for that. We won't spend much time on that, but much could be said about being out of fellowship when he went to Moab. And what it cost him to be out of fellowship. And what it cost his two sons for him to be out of fellowship. Not to mention the pain to his wife and to his daughters-in-law. But we learn some very important things from the reaction of Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth to the death of these three men. Beginning in Ruth chapter 1, verse 8, we read, Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. That verse actually gives us a lot of insight into all three women. Both young women were obviously pleasant young women, and they got along with their mother-in-law. Both were kind and submissive to their husbands, it says so in the text. A lot of women are not kind and submissive to their husbands. But Naomi commends them for that. Both had dealt kindly with their mother-in-law. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. You know, that's something that's rare today. There are not many women who truly deal kindly with their mothers-in-law. They resent them. They disapprove when the mother-in-laws, as they should not do, try to meddle in the affairs of their daughters-in-law and try to still control what their sons do. Now, that's out of place. But we don't see that kind of relationship or we don't see that kind of a problem here in this family. A pleasant mother-in-law, a pleasant two daughters-in-law. In fact, the name Naomi means pleasant. Later she takes the name Mara when she gets back to Bethlehem. She says, don't call me Naomi, don't call me pleasant, call me Mara, which means bitter. Here's something that godly women, godly mothers, godly wives take to heart. Don't let the experiences of life make you bitter. It's so easy to do. You will find disappointments because your husbands are imperfect men. You will find disappointments because your children are imperfect children, no matter how hard you try. You will find disappointments because you live a physical life that is subject to the curse of this world. Don't become bitter. The root of bitterness springing up will not only trouble you, but by it many will be defiled. The book of Hebrews tells us that. And it will cost you tremendously, if you've been with us on Sunday evenings, we've talked about bitterness and all the different effects, 35 different effects that bitterness produces according to scripture. You don't want that to happen to you. Many years ago, I heard a very wise Bible teacher make the statement to single young men, Guys, marry a pleasant woman. That'll go a long way to making a happy marriage. <laughs> Young women, if you want a happy marriage, be a pleasant woman. Young men, consider it well. Don't just marry a girl because she's beautiful or talented. Marry a pleasant woman. 
I might add also, if you're an older woman, don't become bitter. The next verses give us insight into the response of a godly woman as we listen to Naomi. Verses 9 and 10. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. You know, it's interesting to see how Naomi dealt with this situation. It's clear from these verses that she did not think of herself first. She thought about the two young women. She thought about their future. She thought about what was best for them rather than thinking about herself in old age, having to have someone caring for her. She didn't clutch at them and think, now that my husband and sons are gone, who will take care of me? No. You see, she loved these two young women and she cared about them. That shows you a different kind of heart than what we see in the world around us today, where people only think of themselves in their old age and wanting somebody to take care of them. She wanted them to have, quote, rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Notice also, although they've come out of Moab, this pagan land, she gave to each of them the blessing of Jehovah, the God of Israel, the Lord. Grant that you may find rest. The Lord, she truly loved her daughters-in-law. She freely kissed them goodbye and released them, perhaps never to see them again. How hard is it to release people that you love? To say goodbye even though you may never see them again? At the point of death, that's very difficult, but for those who are believers, we know that we will see them again. As we look at this text here, we also notice the two girls' immediate response was to weep and to make a commitment to stay with Naomi. Be careful about the kinds of commitments you make young men and young women and middle-aged and older as well because you may discover down the road that you can't keep your commitment. Make sure that when you make a commitment that you stick with your commitment the godly woman, the godly wife, the godly mother, when she makes a commitment, will stick with her commitment. We're going to see that in a moment as we look at the contrast between Ruth and Orpah. They've made a commitment to stay with Naomi, but it was a matter of their fragile emotions of that moment. They hadn't thought it through yet. Now, you know, Naomi could have used that as a tool to manipulate them into staying with her, pretending to let them go, but huh, not really. You know people like that. They, they fish around until they got a rope on you, and they're pretending one thing, but actually they are meaning something else. And she could have used it as a rope to keep them with her based on their spontaneous promises. But no, Naomi is not merely practical. She's kind and firm and loving as their mother-in-law. Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. While you go with me, are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? And of course, what she's referring to there is the leveret law of marriage, where when a man died without any children, the brother would take his wife to be his wife and then raise up children to the deceased brother. So she says, do I have any more sons? You got the only two sons that I had. Do I have any more sons for you to marry? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, imagine the impossible with me, if you will, she says. Suppose I got married today. Suppose I conceived tonight. Suppose in nine months I had a baby. And then are you going to wait another 17 to 20 years for him to grow up so that you can marry him. Now these were probably pretty young women, probably in the range of 17, 18 years old, as the custom was in those days to marry women young. Would you wait? You'd be twice as old as he is at that point. Would you tarry for them till they're grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? 
In other words, would you really wait around or would you not want to get married sooner than that? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. Naomi takes responsibility. Naomi is the senior member of the household, if you will, at this point. Those in that position as the senior member of the household need to learn to take responsibility and accountability. Here's a woman who's doing it. She's setting an example. She's not feeling sorry for herself, though she recognizes that there is some judgment involved, and we'll be talking about that in a few moments. It grieveth me much for your sakes. There's a woman who is focused on other people rather than being focused on herself. Do you know many women like that? I don't. I had one. And you know how she was focused on others. How she poured out her life for others. That's Naomi. Naomi understands the need for an older woman here to remain single and the younger women to remarry. She's not going to claim Boaz for herself. She has been a good wife, she's been a good mother, and now she thinks only of the good of her daughters-in-law. She's not sorrowful for her own condition under the chastening hand of God, but grieves for their sakes. There's a lesson here for husbands and men who would marry. Listen carefully, men. When we sin and get out of fellowship with the Lord, it costs our wives and our children great pain because they suffer as being one with us and under our authority. That's been true from the days of Adam and Eve. You and I are born dead in trespasses and sins because we were in Adam when he sinned and came under the judgment of God. When Adam was cast out, Eve was cast out too. And you know the horrendous history of their progeny. Cain and Abel and Seth and all the, the descendants that came and then the flood as the world turned corrupt and God spared Noah, a man of righteousness, and brought him and his family through the flood. And then the horrendous things that went on with Ham and Canaan. And then the overspreading of the earth and the rising of all the wickedness and the Tower of Babel and all we see in the Old Testament and then brings us into the New Testament and down to the present day. Your actions affect your family, men. Girls, women, make sure that the man you marry is a man who is walking in fellowship with God. Men, make sure that the woman you marry is a woman who is walking in fellowship with God. Not thinking about herself, but putting Christ first. Naomi understands that need. And now we see a difference in character between a godly young woman and an apparently godly young woman. Both had married into a good lineage. Both had married into a godly heritage, though the lead man was out of fellowship at that time. Both had married into a family that was going to go back to the place where the Messiah would someday be born. In fulfillment of prophecy, and thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth a governor unto me who shall rule my people Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, even from everlasting. Back to the Proto-Evangelicum of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, about the serpent biting the heel and the heel crushing the head of the serpent. And so here we find two young women. One appears to be godly. One is, in fact, godly. It doesn't pay to be a fake. There are a lot of fake Christian women in the church today. Everything looks good until finally they come to grips with what they think is reality. That is, the world from the world's view. 
instead of the world from God's view. The godly woman, the godly wife, the godly mother is one who looks at the world from God's view, not one who looks at the world from man's view. And we see that striking contrast here with these two young women. One accepts the, quote, realism view that her mother-in-law throws out in front of her. The other clings to the divine view of the living God. Friends, this is where the heart of the godly woman begins. This is where the heart of the godly woman begins. Man, that's the kind of woman you should seek, not merely one who makes a token commitment and then turns her back for the sake of her own life, her own pleasure, her own future, her own satisfaction, her own enjoyment, her own people, her own goals. You know, it's interesting, after the next verse here in our text, we never again hear what happened to Orpah. Even though Orpah thought she was making a good choice that would bring her the greatest fulfillment. Remember, wife and mother, choices make a difference. That's this message. Choices make a difference. She thought it would bring her the greatest fulfillment, but she's gone. Back to paganism. To her gods, Naomi mentions her gods. Back to darkness. Back to the pleasures of the world. Back to some degenerate, unsaved man. Back, perhaps, even to have many children, but back to outer darkness. Oh, for the moment, she's filled with emotion and sorrow. She's filled with emotional love. But she makes the wrong choice. Verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clave unto her. And she said, and this is, of course, Naomi speaking, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Sometimes when we get advice, it's to test whether our commitment is true or false. Sometimes when we make a commitment, it will be put to the test, to the fire, to see if we mean it. That's what's happening here. Orpa kisses her mother-in-law goodbye. Perhaps she still had tears in her eyes. She begins to walk back toward Moab. Naomi looks at Ruth, who is still standing there with tears streaming down her face, and says, and so you go too. Come on. Come on, go ahead. Go on back. Those are your people. I'm not your people. Those are your gods. My God's not your God. Go back where you can find a young husband. Go back where you'll find somebody that will love you and will marry you. Go back. Nobody in my place would want to marry you. You're a Moabitess. Don't you understand how impossible that is? Don't you understand how that God's people aren't supposed to marry the Moabites and the Ammonites? Don't you understand that there's nothing where I'm going, nothing for you. Go back, follow your sister-in-law back to her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. But Luke, Ruth doesn't buy into the so-called logical argument. You see, Ruth has made a commitment. Ruth is a woman of integrity. Women, to be a good wife, to be a good mother, to have children who someday will rise up and call you blessed, you need to learn to be a woman of integrity. A woman who keeps her commitments. A woman who always tells the truth. A woman who, when she opens her mouth, 
follows through with her life. That's what we see here with Ruth. She doesn't just buy into the way of thinking of the world all around us. She starts with a different set of premises. She doesn't just do what other young women do. Peer pressure is not what motivates and controls her. Don't buy into peer pressure, young people. Just because somebody else did it doesn't mean it's right. Just because somebody else did it doesn't mean you should do it. Peer pressure is not what motivates and controls her. She doesn't buy into the selfish argument of, well, what's best for me? Folks, that's a selfish argument. A godly woman does not start with the selfish argument. The godly woman does not start with, what's best for me? Too many young women today start with the arguments of pragmatism. Pragmatism is, you know, what's going to work? What's in it for me? Too many start by wanting to know right now what will benefit them personally before they make their decision. And they never consider what is the will of God. But Ruth, as you look at it here, demonstrates that her commitment is genuine, it's true, it's based on substantive and concrete relationship with the true God of Israel. Verse 16, Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. Now listen to all the different things, because I'm going to cover them in just a second. But all the different specific things that she says she will do. And she does every one of them. She doesn't do 90% of them. She makes another commitment. She makes a whole series of commitments here. Whether thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God shall be my God. Where thou diest, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Those are powerful words. They're often used at weddings, indicating the commitment, the total, unabandoned commitment of a wife to her husband and a husband to his wife. But here they're used of a young woman who's making that kind of commitment to her mother-in-law. That's pretty heavy. She's not going to get anything out of this. There's no possibility. She's already heard her mother-in-law say it, of getting another son from Naomi. She makes the commitment, not only because it's the right thing to do, she makes the commitment because she has trusted in the living God of Israel. Young men, young women, older men, older women. That's where the foundations of a godly home begin. You make a commitment, an unwavering commitment, an unswerving commitment to the living God that you will be by His grace in the center of His will. That's why we see the difference between Ruth and Orpah. When she, that is Naomi, saw that she steadfastly was minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they two went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? If you were out of town for a while, and then came back into town, would all the city be moved about you? Would you be well known because of the character that you had had? And everybody is saying, did you hear? Naomi is back in town. All of Bethlehem. Caesar coming into town. It's Naomi. Is it really? Where's her husband? Where's Elimelech? Where's Mahlon? Where's Kilian? Who is that young woman who's with her? I don't know, but she doesn't look Jewish. Who is that? Is it really Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, 
And the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi? Seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. Naomi has fallen into despair, into grief. And when that happens, we often don't see things from God's perspective. She did go out full, but she did not return empty. She doesn't know it yet, but as the women in chapter 4 said to her, this daughter-in-law that you've got is better to you than seven sons. Look at the way she loves you. Look at the way she treats you. Look at what she's done for you. Oh, may she be a blessing to you and to many generations to come. That's because Ruth is a godly woman who is going to become a godly wife, who is going to become a godly mother. You cannot separate those three things. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Well, I can tell we're not going to get through all four chapters, but I'll give you a quick shot as much as I can. We're already four minutes from deadline. So, lesson one. For the women and girls who would be godly wives and mothers, put the Lord Jesus Christ first in your life. Don't let anything dissuade you from the closest possible relationship with Him. Don't leave Him. Don't fail to follow Him. These are the things, remember what Ruth said to Naomi? She said, I won't leave you. Uh, I'm going to follow you. Don't leave Him. Don't fa uh, fail to follow Him. Don't go anywhere without Him. Lodge where He lodges. Let His people be your people. That means you ought to be in church. Make him truly your God. Cling to this to the day you die and be buried with that testimony. This is a woman who feared the Lord, who loved God with her whole heart, who obeyed him, who served him, who died in his grace. Notice that last phrase in verse 22. They came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. That is a tiny notice, but it's a huge notice that the timing of God is always perfect. Not too early, not too late came at precisely the right time because God was going to have Ruth meet Boaz and God was going to have Boaz meet Ruth and it was going to be in a context where certain character qualities of the godly man and the godly woman would be evident one to the other so that God could irresistibly draw them together. For the men and boys, that's the kind of woman that you want as your wife and the mother of your children. Chapter 2 introduces us to that kind of man the godly woman wants to marry. The godly man who that godly woman wants to be the father of her children. If you're not this kind of a man, don't expect God to bring you a godly wife into your life. Chapter 2, enter Boaz, stage right. The first two character characteristics, characteristics <laughs> I can't talk too fast. I've, I've got to say a few things and I'll slow it down. The first two characteristics that we learn about Boaz was that he was a leader and he was financially stable. That's in verse 1 of chapter 2, where we're introduced to this man. A godly Christian man will seek to be a leader for the glory of God in whatever sphere he is placed. He'll also be a man who carefully deals with the resources that God has entrusted to him and will be financially stable. There are so many young men today who call themselves Christians who are out there just sort of floating through life and doing nothing and not working a job and not being busy with their hands and sitting around and watching TV and popping uh, popcorn into their mouths and fooling around with their friends and hanging out and doing all the cool stuff that's out there. That is not the kind of man you want to marry, girls. And young men, that's not the kind of man you ought to be if you want a godly wife. Nothing happens by chance. We see that in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 2 here in the book of Ruth. Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose eyes I shall find grace. And she said unto her daughter, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hat <laughs> was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. She didn't know who owned which fields. The cities in ancient Israel were surrounded by a certain portion of land given to them all the way back in the days of Moses that were divided among, up among the families that were in that particular city. She had no idea which field was whose. 
Do you not see the underlying hand of God sovereignly working to direct a young woman who has made a commitment to him? You want to be a godly wife? You want to be a godly mother? Make your commitment to Jesus Christ first and foremost. And God will direct your path, even though it looks like it's by accident. There are no accidents in the plan of God, only incidents. She lighted upon the field belonging to Boaz. The next characteristic of the godly man is that the godly woman will want, that the godly woman will want is that the Lord is the center of his life and he's not ashamed of an open testimony. Look at verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. He didn't say, Hey guys, how's it going? Hey, looks like you've got a lot of work done today. Hey, that's uh, pretty good. Uh, make sure you get everything and cut as close to the corners as you possibly can. We don't want to leave too much out there for the widows and orphans. Under the law, of course, the corners of the field were to be left for the widows and the orphans. He didn't say, look, let's get it going here pretty quick. I'd like to get my harvest in before everybody else gets their harvest in because I want to be the first at the market. Everybody wants the barley. Let's get going, guys. Come on, move it along, move it along. He didn't give them a motivational speech. What did he say to them? The Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless thee. There was an employer who didn't mind talking about God to his employees and employees who were delighted to respond because they had a godly, godly master. Characteristics of the godly man. God will direct the attention of the godly man at the right time to the right woman. That's verses 5 and 6. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. It tells you something about the character of that young woman. She was diligent. You know, most American girls that I meet today are frivolous. They are not diligent. How I thank God that he gave me a wife who raised diligent daughters. You know my daughters. You know how diligent they are. You know that they never waste a spare minute, that they try to pack into it everything that they possibly can for the glory of Christ. They want to maximize their potential. God gave me a diligent wife. God gave me diligent daughters. God gave me diligent sons. Diligence is one of the key character qualities that will make for a godly marriage. Do not waste the time, energy, resources, talent that God has given you. Focus it for the service of Christ and use it for everything you're worth. She's a diligent woman. She's asked her mother-in-law for permission to go out and work. And she goes out and works, and she works, and she works. From early morning until the late afternoon, the sun is going down. She's worked through the heat of the day. She stops for lunch. Boaz takes note of that. God drew his attention to her. The godly woman is exceptionally diligent. The godly man will be concerned and protective and will provide. Look at verses 8 through 9. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and do thou go after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. He is concerned for her protection. He's concerned for her moral purity. He's concerned to the extent that he threatens to break the neck of any young man who tries to touch her. They might try to take advantage of her. Hey, she's a foreigner. Hey, she's a widow. Hey, there's nobody here to protect her. No male relative to protect her. She doesn't have her father or brothers here. She doesn't have her father-in-law here. She doesn't have a husband here. Hey, we'll go after this one. Boy, I says, not on your life or I'll break your neck. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? But more than that, I know you don't have any source of water and refreshment out here in the field. It's okay. I've got my guys. They've brought the water out here. You feel free to go and take a drink when you need it. I know what it's like out here in the hot sun. She's diligent. 
The godly man will be concerned and protective, will provide. Godly women will be truly virtuous, and a public testimony concerning her will be the same. Look at verses 10 and 11. She fell on her face, bowed herself to the ground, and said, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And he gives the right answer. Not, you're a cute chick. I thought maybe this would induce you to stay around. He didn't say that. Why are you doing this? Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath been fully showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. He saw in her the character of a woman of God. Oh, how much more there is to say here. She responds appropriately, verses 13 through 17. The way that a godly woman should respond at the offer of a godly man to provide with no thought of return. He has no thought of return here. You read verses 13 through 17, you'll see that. Boaz has no hope that she would be a benefit to him in any way. I think, and I'll just go through this quickly, we won't have time to read the verses, the key verses, but I'm going to summarize it for you. It'll be clear to those in authority over the godly woman that God is providing a special way. We see that when Naomi sees the humongous amount of grain that Ruth brings back at the end of the day in verses 18 through 22. Chapter 3 is the narrative of how Naomi plans for Ruth's best and how Ruth is obedient. Verse 5 of chapter 3, And she said, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. We discover that Ruth is morally pure in chapter 3, verse 10. She doesn't chase men either young or old, for money or power or sex or whatever else out there there is. She's morally pure. Boaz is honorable and wants a virtuous wife. That's chapter 3, verse 11. Ruth waits humbly and patiently to see what God will do after Boaz has made a commitment to her. She doesn't fret and bite her nails and worry about it. And then the chapter we read, chapter 4, Boaz is wise. You know, Boaz doesn't really need any more land. He's got some nice fields, that's obvious. His land grabber relative wants the land, but knows that he has to fulfill the requirements of the law. If he takes the land, he's got to take the widow. You know, Boaz is willing to take Ruth, even though it means that his very first son will be considered the heir of Elimelech. And then finally, we see the final blessing at the end of chapter 4. Ruth becomes the ancestress of King David. And therefore, by the grace of God, pulling a woman out of pagan darkness because she trusted in the living God, she becomes the ancestress of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What did Orpah give up by not coming back to Bethlehem? We'll never know. What did Orpah get by going back into pagan darkness and pagan gods? I suspect, though I cannot say for sure, that she's in hell today. Wife and mother. Choices make a difference. What did Ruth get because she was committed and kept her word? Ruth had the blessing of becoming the ancestress of the Messiah, the God-man, the one who will reign and live forever and with whom we shall be as his people someday in heaven. Young men, do you want a godly wife, a godly mother for your children? Be careful whom you choose, young women. You want to be a godly wife and a godly mother and be able to raise children in the fear of the Lord. Be careful what man you marry, because it will make all the difference. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and for its power. 
We thank you for the privilege of being able to look into the scriptures and see their real people. People who were born and who grew up. And who had all the same human emotions that we have and who lived and who died and in between made choices. Made definitive choices that directed the courses of their lives and the results that came about. Father, we thank you for this testimony of Ruth. A woman who was a godly wife. A woman who was a godly mother. A woman who raised a little boy in the fear of the Lord. Who raised a little boy and then who raised another little boy who became the king of Israel. And the father of those who would be the ancestor of Christ. Help us, Father, with the choices that we make, that it would glorify Jesus Christ. That each of us in the choices that we make would seek to maximize the potential that you've given to us for the glory of Christ. Those choices that are so often controlled by the flesh, by our human emotions, by our internal drives, the things that we want for ourselves instead of thinking, God, what is it that you want for me? so that Jesus Christ can be glorified in me and through me. Father, we've, I suspect most of us here, made at least a token commitment to Christ. We've expressed a verbal commitment, as Orpah did with Naomi, but when push comes to shove, we back out because of our own convenience, our own pleasure, our own desires, our own future goals, instead of deciding Regardless of what it costs me, I will do the will of God and sticking with it. Once again, Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. We pray for your blessings upon your word as it gone forth, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. And so we commit this your word to our hearts and to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn today is number 451, A Christian Home. 451, let's stand to sing. We'll sing all the verses.